Street Church. Good morning. We welcome you this morning to our hour of worship. Uh, those of you here in the sanctuary this morning, as well as those who are watching at home. We pray that uh, our gathering today and our worship will, to give God glory will be uh, a motivation for you to have many blessings this week. Jesus says the kingdom of God is much like a mustard seed. It's a tiny seed, but it has a lot of surprises in store for us. Because when it is sown, it becomes a bush. And in that bush, even the birds find places in the branches for its nests. That's the way God's transforming love is. It can begin small and then in small ways, and then it begins to grow. So in our worship this morning, May each of us allow God to plant those amazing seeds of God's transforming love so that we might grow, grow into deeds of service to others in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Eternal God, you are the Lord of preparation and the Lord of transitions. And here we are already halfway through the summer. Perhaps we sit and wonder, where has the time gone? How did we spend it? Did we spend it well in your service? So we pray that you would give us these next few weeks for renewal, that we may be prepared to work through your church for your world. Keep us mindful of the needs of family and friends and others, that we will be your faithful disciples. And we ask these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Let's. Lord, 
you diligently watch over us at all times and are with us all these days. We confess that we have allowed a host of worries and frustrations to crowd out your work for us. And you give us peace in your transforming love. Also forgive all those times when we have been less than faithful disciples. Gently visit us again with your healing powers. Restore our hope and courage and joy for all the times ahead. We ask this in the name of the Master Healer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in a period of silence. Here are some wonderful news. While we were worrying and fretting, God has been at work in our lives offering healing and peace. Receive these gifts in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Larry? Is David smiling? 
I sure hope so. How about Rebecca? Is Rebecca smiling? Yeah, Rebecca's smiling. See what happens when we offer just a little thing, just a little bit of a smile, and it grows to everyone else, and we're all smiling. And Jesus is saying, that's what the kingdom of God is like. You just do a little thing, and it and begins to grow. It grows and grows and grows. And it affects everyone. Oh, Jesus' love is wonderful, Pastor Larry. That's great news, isn't it? It's wonderful news. But Pastor Larry, okay. everybody else, if they have their mask on, they can smile with their eyes. That's right. But my eyes, they just sort of stay the same. Yeah, they're smiling. But what can I do? Can I do something different? Uh, <laughs> no, I think, I think they're smiling. You think so? I think so. Let's you, have a prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God. Gracious God. We're thankful that even the smallest task that we can do. We're thankful that even the smallest task that we can do. That can bring people into your kingdom. That can bring people into your kingdom. Brings so much joy to our hearts. Brings so much joy into our hearts. Amen. Amen. Bye-bye. Let's see you, Pastor Larry. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>
morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, reading from chapter 13, reading verses 31 through 33, and then 44 through 52. Let us hear the word of our Lord. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it becomes the largest of garden plants. It becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So it was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Then he continues. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought the land. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went and sold everything he had to buy that pearl. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The past few weeks, Pastor Andy has been preaching on some of the parables from the Gospel of Matthew. And this morning, as we heard, this is a continuation of Jesus' teaching through the use of parables. For Jesus, this was the best way of communicating his message. He would take something ordinary, something that people would be familiar with and use it to convey his message about the kingdom of God. And many times he would say the kingdom of God, or in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is life. And then he would tell the story. In all, there are 54 parables that Jesus told in the Synoptic Gospels. And here in Matthew that we've been reading the past few weeks, there are 23 of those parables. And sometimes he would speak to large crowds, like a couple this morning, he was speaking to people as they were sitting along the lake. Other times he would be speaking just to his disciples, like the last parable we heard, he was in a house talking just to the disciples. This morning we heard him preaching, teaching, in three different parables. The parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the yeast, the parable of the hidden treasure, excuse me, there's four, and the parable of the pearl. The parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast, he is talking to the crowd as they are out by the lake. And then he departs that scene and goes into a house with his 12 disciples, and that's where he shares the parable of the treasure and the pearl. We have two parables that point to the persevering nature of the kingdom. As we heard from just a tiny seed, a mustard seed, grows this rather large bush. It grows about 10 feet high. It's not the large tree that we would think of. But it's big enough that birds will go and build their, their nests in it. Branches that are strong enough to offer shelter and hope, peace and safety. In a nutshell, Jesus is saying that we should be like that. We should be like that, the kingdom of heaven. Offering shelter, offering hope, offering peace for other people. Then he switches gears. He says the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. It's been hidden in a bushel, in a bushel of wheat flour. And then it proves itself works its way through the dough, bringing nourishment. The message being to those people who hear the disciples are those who can nourish and those who can bring hope to all people is what the kingdom is about. 
And when we do that, God is with us. That is not an impossible task. We can do it. Well, as I was looking at the lectionary this week, and he's like, well, which of these parables do I preach on, or do I try to wrap all four of them in, into one sermon? I, I decided I'd really like to try the one about the hidden treasure. For those of us who are over 60, <laughs> you might recall one of the more popular TV shows was The Beverly Hillbillies. It ran for nine seasons from 1962 through 1971. It's a story of Chad Clampett and his family. And if you've never seen this classic show, let me just remind you of what it's all about. Chad Clampett is, as the song, opening song tells us, a poor mountaineer who barely kept his family fed. Then one day he was shooting at some food, and up from the ground came bubbly crude, oil that is, black gold, Texas tea. So here's this poor country hillbilly from the Ozarks, one day out hunting, just to survive, give food for his family, and he misses his shot and makes a hole in the ground, and up comes this oil. And he goes and he sells his property for $25 million and moves into a mansion in Beverly Hills. A man who goes from rags to riches. And then for all these seasons, the, uh, the show just uh, chronicles the funny things that happen of a country family who all of a sudden become millionaires and move into the bright lights of the big city of Beverly Hills with the swimming pools and with the movie stars. Now the parable that Jesus is telling in Matthew is quite similar to that. Almost the same as what the Clampets found themselves in after Jed's miraculous discovery. The man out in the parable was out in the field trying to get food for his family. In other words, he, he was farming and uh, he's going about his daily routine that he does every day more than likely, he's a country peasant, like Jed. And in the course of this ordinary task, he encounters an extraordinary treasure. Now, we're not told what the treasure is that the man finds, but evidently it is worth so much that he's willing to go back and sell everything he has in order to buy that property where the treasure is. Now, it might sound like a strange story, at in many ways, but as we look at this parable, it's important for us to keep in mind the cultural and historical context in which Jesus tells this parable. <coughs> Excuse me. We have to remember that in Jesus' day, there were no such things as Bank of America or SEFQ, in which a person would place their valuables for safekeeping. Instead, warfare and political strife was a common occurrence in those days. And sometimes the best place, the safest place to put your treasure was to go out and bury it. But then the problem was, what if you die before you tell anyone where you buried it? It still was the safest place to put your valuables. This was rather common. In fact, it was so common, the rabbis had done some thinking about this issue. And there was an understanding that if a man found some treasure in the ground, hidden somewhere, and there was no one to claim it, it became his. It's kind of a historical, old-time, archaic, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Well, the man in the story found something very valuable in the ground. So he hides it again. Then he goes and he sells everything he has to buy that field. And this man is so filled with joy of what just came out of the ground that he wasn't going to let anything get in the way of him having that treasure. You know, most people get depressed when they have to sell some possessions or uh, even if they have to give all they have. 
The pawn shops and antique stores are full of things that people at one time had. When Merle and I moved to Bloomington five years ago, we moved from a rather large house to a smaller condo. We had to go through that downsizing thing. And it's very difficult to pick something up and say, do you keep it or you, do you let it go? <coughs> in fact, comically, we had so much stuff to get rid of that I've gone to Goodville so many times, they knew me by my first name. I pulled in and they said, Larry, what you got for us today? Getting rid of things was not really uh, a joyful experience for us. But once it was over, it was wonderful. But this fortunate farmer from the parable is actually happy about having to go and sell everything he has in order to buy that land. Nothing else matters. He gives up all else that he has, and he does it joyfully. He's happy about it because he knows he's going to have this treasure, this treasure that's under the ground. <coughs> you know, I'm happy for that guy. I hope we have the discernment and the cunning and the wisdom that that man has. You know, too many people spend their time buying things that they later can't joyfully depart with. We spend our time pursuing treasure that is on top of the ground. Our treasures might be our bank accounts with a lot of money in them, or our fancy cars, or our nice homes, or a really good set of golf clubs, or having the latest, largest plasma television. And look all you want. You simply won't find buried treasure on top of the ground. The real treasure is under the ground. Jan Clampett was so fortunate. He was looking for some food on top of the ground, but he missed it. He missed his shot, and his target made a hole. A hole that brought him much joy, obviously. Sometimes I think we would be fortunate if we would miss the hole we aim at. We need to aim at not what is temporary, but what is eternal. But there's a sad thing about the Clampets, too. After they struck it rich, they entered the rat race, which all the other people of that area, all the other people of great wealth, were in. They moved to Beverly Hills. They had a swimming pool. They had a beautiful mansion. And although they kept a lot of their country ways, the Clampets were just not the same after that. In a way, all of their innocence was gone when they became millionaires and got caught up in the rat race that all of the other people were caught up in. But you see, even though you might win the rat race, you're still a rat. The central point that Jesus is trying to tell us in these parables is that the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, the same thing, is more valuable than anything else. And there's a twofold message concerning the value of the kingdom. First, it's more valuable than anything you can ever know. <clears throat> it's worth more than all of your money. It's worth more than all of your possessions can accrue. It's even more worth than your treasured earthly relationships. And second, because it's worth more than all else, it requires being willing to surrender, surrender everything to Jesus. In order to present, in order to purchase the kingdom, to possess the kingdom, that's life's greatest treasure. There's a tragedy in this, however, because a lot of people simply will not give up their possessions, and they choose to reject the kingdom. 
Becoming a part of God's kingdom through Jesus Christ is life's greatest treasure for all of us. What are you willing to give up to fully live in God's kingdom? What is the treasure of your life? Amen. Let us stand as we sing. God gives us the opportunity from our bounty to give for the ministries of our work here at St. Luke Union Church, that Christ's redeeming love might be known to all people. And we appreciate your willingness and your faithfulness in giving. And you are invited to make your offering uh, to the offering plate as you depart this morning, or if you are home, the, to mail it into the church. All of your gifts are so appreciated. Let us pray. Lord, as we give of our gifts and you receive them, we pray that you would cause all of these blessings to work for you in this world, which you have loaned to us for safekeeping. We give it and offer it in the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.
As we go into uh, a time of prayer this morning, we have some celebrations to, to share, uh, as well as some prayer concerns. Uh, our celebrations, uh, Ken and uh, Sarah Kellum are observing their wedding anniversary. Uh, Norman Lopez had a birthday yesterday. Happy birthday, Norman. Olivia Trower had her birthday yesterday. Marilyn had her birthday, has her birthday today, and as I say, I will tell her age, but there's a zero in it. <laughs> uh, Adam Southwick uh, has a birthday today. Anna the Brood has a birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, Anna. And Charles Parlett has one on the 29th. So we celebrate these events in their lives, as well as prayer concerns. Uh, Karen Walters uh, fell this past week, I understand, and broke her collarbone, and she is at home, I think, uh, doing okay. And Bonnie Rennick had a knee replacement surgery Thursday, and I think I heard that she is also at home and doing okay. Would there be other concerns you would wish to share from the congregation? If not, then let us go into prayer. <clears throat> Eternal God, you are one of surprising love. You have called us to be your treasure, to be those who love and serve you by helping meet the needs of others. This morning, Jesus reminded us that we are like mustard seeds that grow into mighty shelters for those who might feel abandoned, or that we are like yeast placed in flour, causing the whole dough to rise and be fruitful to, for the nourishment of your people. Later, he says, we are like nets, cast into the sea, gathering people for you, that they might be healed and saved. You place so much hope and trust in us. We pray that we not fail you. We bring before you this day persons and situations who need your healing love. We pray for body as she goes through her recovery. We pray, pray for care. We also pray for those who put their own lives in peril as they work to combat COVID-19. Help us to be vehicles of that word for all of these people. Give each one of us the courage and the power to serve you boldly and joyfully. For it is in the healing love of Christ that we offer our prayer. And now we, your people, pray as one the prayer your Son has taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, <clears throat> hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have, <clears throat> excuse me, a few announcements to share. Uh, Lisa sends out an email uh, every Thursday, so you might want to check uh, every Thursday for what's coming news. Uh, Bible study is held tomorrow at noon on Zoom. If you'd like to join in, uh, Andy leads us through next week's uh, scripture readings. <clears throat> and uh, if you need the password to get into Zoom, you can call Lisa and she'll give it to you. Also on Wednesdays at noon, uh, is a prayer gathering. Uh, we uh, get together and share needs and, and joys and celebrations and spend an hour of, of, of fellowship. There again on Zoom, if you'd like to join in, uh, please call Lisa for the uh, password. And I'm also to stress that uh, after our service, please remain where you are and allow the ushers to, to lead you out so that we don't all get in one little Disease, not or whatever you want to call it. Let us stand as we sing our last hymn. 